Hi, this is Terry. We are on a two-week break between seasons, and we ask that during these two weeks you listen to a rebroadcast from our archives. We will be back August 21st with a new season and new episodes. Thanks for listening. Hello, and thank you for joining us on Giving Voice to Depression. I'm Bridget. And I'm Terry. More than 350 million people worldwide suffer from depression, but you do not have to have it yourself to be affected by it. Its prevalence pretty much guarantees that someone you care about battles its darkness. This podcast tries to shine some light into that darkness. We're not experts, and we're not therapists. We're sisters and best friends who live with depression and are committed to encouraging healthy, healing conversations about mental illness. At the end of each season, we like to pause and take a moment not only to thank the people who shared their stories to help fight stigma and isolation, but to reflect on some of the lessons that we've learned from each. There is so much healing and comfort in hearing stories you relate to, told by people you relate to. And all of the podcasts that we're going to be talking about and summarizing in this edition, we want to thank the Charles E. Kubley Foundation for sponsoring. Thank you very much. We're going to start this review with the first two episodes in Season 3. They were The Power of Compassion and The Power of Empathy. It was an amazing and inspiring two-part story of a young man, Johnny, who had left a psychiatric hospital and gone to a bridge in London to end his life. And Neil, who was a total stranger with no mental health training, happened to walk by, and he cared enough to stop. I don't know. There was something different about this guy, because he just, I don't know, he just listened in a way I hadn't been listened to before. Hmm. And the first thing he said to me was, there's nothing to be embarrassed about. That's what he said. He said, no no reason to be embarrassed or ashamed. And I've never had anyone say that before. And it was so powerful. It was so powerful. And that, yeah, and it made me talk. One thing I could tell, like, he he wasn't there for anybody's attention, you know. He was, he was in his own world, you know. So then in part two, we fast forward six years. Johnny, who's the man on the bridge, he's received treatment, and he wants to share news of his recovery with Neil, the stranger who gave him hope. I realized I'm not alone, and I think that was a big thing for me you know, talking and I actually asked for help and said I do need therapy and, you know, engaging with therapy and, you know, uh, eventually taking meds as well. And when I really got back on track, that's when I decided to launch the campaign to find this guy. And I had absolutely no idea that this campaign was like viral, like on Twitter, on Facebook, on social media. Uh, It was trending around the world, but I hadn't seen, I like personally, I hadn't seen it. It was called the Find Mike campaign. So it was hashtag Find Mike. So he thought my name was Mike, um, which wasn't uh, obviously the best start <laughs> to the campaign. I just love that story, don't you, Bridget? Yes, and I love that that wasn't the right name, and yet it was meant to be, and it happened. I do, too. And an amazing thing that happened after that aired is a woman on Twitter reached out and said that she had heard that story, and she said, I'm Johnny. I was over the reel. And she said she had never told anyone in her life. And she wrote us and said later, thank you for the courage to tell my story. And she's now doing that. And I said, you had the courage. We didn't give you anything except maybe permission. So, you know, it's one of those amazing ripples that can happen when one person starts to talk and someone else feels emboldened or empowered or just a little bit safer sharing their own story. Absolutely. Permission is um, a lot. It is a lot. You know, it's a yes. It's a you matter, you're worth it. Mm -hmm. In our next episode, A Unique Perspective with Kevin Briggs, otherwise known as the guardian of the Golden Gate Bridge, Kevin reminds us that people in crisis as well as every day need to be listened to and heard. You know, I used to say it's like a cancer. We need the medication to help. But really, it's it's more of like diabetes. Mm -hmm. It can be lifelong. And if we don't handle it, whether that's through therapy, drugs, whatever else, it can get worse. So don't be ashamed about it. If you are suffering, there is help out there. Sometimes it takes a while to get things right. And he was really clear, too, in sharing his own personal story and that it took him a while to get things right because he himself has depression, which probably helps him to be more empathetic when he's talking to people on the bridge. Exactly. And he was honest enough to share with us, Terry, that at the beginning, he was even critical or judgmental of people with mental illness. Right. So he, he, you know, he really, 
he, he embraced it in a way that um, changed many people's lives. Indeed. And then the next episode was called College Depression. And we were honored to be asked to speak at an Active Minds National Conference in Washington, D.C. And while we were there, we met Justin. And he shared his story so that we could explore the prevalence of depression in college-aged people. We talked with Justin on his 23rd birthday. And he is, to use his words, like a different person than his younger, despondent self. And he wants anyone struggling to really take that in. He was in the bottom of that dark hole. And he's not anymore. Going from being 18, not wanting to see 19, to being 23, like, what can I do? What is my future going to look like? Mm-hmm. I hit the rock bottom. I know. I, I can't speak to what you're going through personally, but I get it. You can get better. I know it seems bad. I know it seems impossible. I've had those thoughts, too. Mm-hmm. It's a long process. And it's a fight. It is. But it's worth it. It's worth it. And that reminder that, you know, it doesn't feel like it when you're in it. But when you're lucky enough to be one step away from it, you can see that it ebbs and flows. It gets easier. Yep. It gets easier. Uh, In our next episode, which we called Building Your Recovery Brick by Brick, author Brent Williams shares his personal journey through depression and the darkness. He focuses on the importance of self-care and being kind to yourself as much as you can along the way. Depression is a wake-up call. You've got to listen and, and slowly, you know, do the things that you need to do to get well. You've got to just make small gains and build. So I love the expression, build your recovery. Sort of just imagine you're building a brick wall. You need a lot of bricks and you need a good solid base and you just go from there one brick at a time. And it can take a lot of bricks. Yes, and sometimes you need more than bricks. You use whatever works. Whatever works. And there are, in addition to many factors in recovering from or managing your depression, there are many things that factor into a person's experience of it. And for Philip, race is one of them. So in the episode Black Mental Health Matters, Philip Roundtree, who we met at a mental health conference, he walked into the room with this huge smile and a T-shirt that said, this is what depression looks like. And I said, I got to talk to this guy. I think the overall stigma of mental health is just universal. You know, we're not supposed to talk, as a society, we're not supposed to talk about it. You know, your troubles are your troubles. You're supposed to deal with it. You're supposed to be strong. You're supposed to be resilient. You're supposed to be able to overcome and pull yourself up by the bootstraps. Um, Me being a a man, you know, that's intensified. And then when we come and add the me being a black man, it's to the point where at times it's just unbearable. There it is again, Terry. We need to talk. It does. It makes such a difference. Our next episode we called Depression, the Holidays, and Scrooge. And while it was recorded as a sort of holiday episode, having good boundaries and self-care is a year-round reality. And we were lucky enough to have psychologist Anita Sands with us, and we'll have her again joining us next season using that lens of compassion, try to understand why would it be difficult for someone to feel the joy and the peace and the love that is supposed to be available at the holidays? You know, what's blocking that? What is going on? Is it grief? Is it pain? Is it suffering? Is it some of the symptoms of depression that make it impossible to feel pleasure or happiness? Is it the lack of energy so that getting out is just so overstimulating, it's exhausting? You know, trying to understand things from the perspective of the person who's going through that. And I don't think we do that very often. Agreed. And Bridget, talk about the amazing thing that happened in our Facebook community over the holidays, because that was just so amazing. It was. We have a Facebook community that is very engaged, and we had three members during the holidays, which are already difficult times, going through personal tragedies and crisis, and they were brave enough to reach out to the Mm -hmm. community and Mm -hmm. say that they were struggling and having a hard time. And in response, the outpouring of support of more than 500 of our members telling them that they'll be okay, that they're in their hearts, that they're in their prayers, Mm -hmm. giving them encouraging messages, the outpouring was so overwhelmingly supportive was. and encouraging it and loving was. that, again, it made a yep. difference because they had the courage to reach out. And the one woman who wrote back and said, that was undoubtedly the worst day of my life, and you were all there for me and helped make it 
you know, get helped her get through it, which I just, again, there's a lot of power Beautiful. in this. It is. And, and even in the last 24 hours, it's happening again, right? Right now. Oh, the gentleman People who wrote? are yes, yes. Know, responding and reaching out and maybe not telling their whole story on a podcast, but in a few sentences, summarizing right. their struggles. And others are, are chiming in and saying, me too, me too. Absolutely. And this worked for me and it'll, it'll get better. the whole point of community. Exactly. And we keep talking about listening. The next episode was called The Gift of Listening. And in it, we heard from Robert. And when I volunteered at a crisis hotline, he coached me in compassion and empathy and the power of listening. I think the first way and the most immediate is to be there to listen to them. They need a chance to vent. They need a chance to talk about what they're experiencing. And the listening part is a a tremendous gift because there are so very, very few people who will do that for somebody else without feeling the need to interject some kind of advice. And also, if you're really good at that part of it, you can reflect back to them what they're saying and saying, well, you're telling me you're suffering and medications haven't worked. Have you talked to somebody recently because new medications are coming out all the time? And always pose it as a question and come in sideways. Bridget, I'm going to interject real fast here with an example of reflective listening because one of the gentlemen who wrote on our Facebook page said that he was having a really difficult time, but in the brief summary or note that he wrote, he also mentioned two things that had worked for him in the past and that he wanted to be better. And just reflecting that back, I said, well, it sounds like you know what has worked for you and it sounds like you're ready to do it. And then he wrote and said, you know, half an hour later, I've reached out, I've made an appointment, just saying why I need it was the beginning of feeling like I have lightened the load. So, Mm. right, that's, you know, that's not counseling, that's listening, because I'm not qualified, we're not qualified to counsel, but anybody can listen. The next episode, starting the conversation with comedian Frank King, where he shares his journey and talks about the great comfort that can be felt by hearing what he calls a fellow traveler share their experience and how we can relate to some and not relate to others, but it all comes together sort of as a mosaic where we feel a part of it. We, we, we identify and um, just talking to someone who gets it can mm-hmm. make a big difference. Absolutely. I do have something to say. I, I can make a difference, you know, and then I, then as I begin to research, and find out, you know, 39, 40,000 people a year in the U.S. in their lives by suicide and 2,400 college students attempt it, you know, three a day every day die by suicide. I realize, unfortunately, there's a rather large niche there that's not being served. There are people out there who don't realize that there are other people out there who have the same thought process. And then in the next episode, which was called Don't Ignore the Signs of Childhood Depression, it was a 69-year-old woman looking back 60 years on her 10-year-old self and the clear but ignored signs of her childhood depression. And she implored us as adults to do a better job of caring for the young people in our lives. By ending the stigma, by educating everybody about what this is, we can get to the point where children who have depression, no matter what age, are identified and are directed toward the help they need, including every member of their family. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think looking back, I think, you know, any help that I would have been given, and by that I mean qualified help, uh, would have changed the direction of my life. One of the images that really haunts me from Sally's episode where she was talking about having uh, how it felt like she had her oh, her the coat yeah her yeah. blue wool, wool coat that was mm. just soaked through yeah. and it made life and every moment yeah. heavy and cold and, and difficult and uncomfortable yeah yep. oh that image is so it was poignant. really good it is and in our third ripple report where we talk about um how the podcast's people who have reached out to us and shared with us how the podcasts have affected them and their actions out in the world. Right. And this time it was a, a lovely group of young actors who were part of the Tribe Theater Company, and they were reflecting on the value of hearing other stories and struggles and how that builds understanding, compassion, and empathy for others and for self. Mm-hmm. And they'll think, oh, I remember that play, and I remember that story, and I remember that it's okay to have these feelings that I might have, and that there are people out there that can 
relate to me and that I, like, that I'm not alone. I feel like so often we have to like pretend that we're fine right. and like for some reason we feel like we're not allowed to say how we're feeling. Like if we're feeling shitty, we feel like you know, like not, not negative things. Yeah. Yeah, and then for me, I know it becomes more about the I'm feeling shitty, and now I'm gonna beat myself up for feeling, feeling shitty. shitty. Yeah. And so for me, hearing these stories is so empowering because everybody sharing their stories is saying like, no, I'm actually there are times when I'm really not okay, mm-hmm. and just like speaking to that mm-hmm. is really giving it to the societal norm of feeling that we have to pretend that everything is okay. And speaking of pretending everything is okay, the last episode was called Depression, a Couple's Perspective. And in that, we heard how one partner's lifelong conditioning to keep her depression to herself resulted in her being a young adult for whom stigma still affects how she lives and treats her depression. Right now, I don't accept my depression as what it is. I constantly keep putting myself down for not being stronger than the depression. And I think that if I had been in an environment that accepted mental, like my illness as an illness and not as just a teenager being a teenager, I think I would now in my current life here at 22, I would feel stronger with my depression rather than weaker because I have it. So that is the end of season three, our wrap up. And we want to make a point of thanking the Charles E. Kubley Foundation one more time for sponsoring the 13 episodes, including this one from our third season. We're going to take a little break uh, to do some of the paperwork for the grant and to get our taxes done. And then we'll be back in March. But we still will be posting daily on our Facebook, giving voice to depression and on Twitter. And a big shout out to all who have shared their stories Keep talking, keep sharing. It does make a difference. Even if it feels scary, even if you're just telling yourself your story, talk about it. Continue to be kind to yourself and to others. We hope that these shared stories bring out a little more understanding or help people articulate their experiences of depression a little more clearly or more freely. Thanks to all, everyone who's digging deep and finding the words and finding the courage to give voice to depression. You can find all the other episodes, some resources, and a blog on our website, givingvoicetodepression.com. And you can find the podcast most of the other places that you find podcasts. Just Google it, as our mom says. (laughs) (laughs) And please remember, if you're hurting, speak up. If someone else is hurting, listen up. 